All right. Well, so thank you much, uh, everybody, for having me here. And I've, and I've heard that, so people are maybe a little bit nervous about asking questions. So I put together a little Google Doc that if you want to type in your questions, please do so. I will try to get to them afterwards. So, uh, and, if, and if I don't get to them, these questions help me improve the talk. I'm always trying to make the talk better and more understandable. Uh, and so if you just go to this URL, you'll be redirected to the Google Doc. So if, if at any point you want to ask a question, go ahead there. OK. All right. So uh, my name is David Blevins. And uh, we work on, uh, I'm with a company called Tommy Tribe. And we do a lot of stuff in middleware space with Jakarta EE, MicroProfile. we one of the people behind Apache Tommy, which is kind of the enterprise version of Tomcat. Uh, and we had a, we rolled out Tommy with a big customer a couple years ago, and they looked at us and they said, "Great, now it's running. How do we secure this thing?" And we're like, "Basic auth." So of course that doesn't work, and so we had to do a lot of you know research really quickly to figure out uh, what was the best practices uh, in this space. And having participated in the standards for a long time. Uh, you know, we're a part of the, 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 the JCP and the Java community process. And, you know, you know that there's always people in the standards who don't like the standard. And they, they get mad about the direction that it's going in. So we kind of read, like, the first version of OAuth 2 and various specifications like that, saw whose name was on the specification, looked at the most recent version, saw whose names were not on the specification, contact them, ask them what they think, and then they can't stop ranting about all the stuff that is wrong, which gives you a nice a counter perspective to the spec lead, which always says this spec solves world hunger if you just do it right. And, uh, and so it was, it was pretty good to, to get up to speed. And so after having gone through this process, you know, uh, we wanted to try and come up with a talk that would make it easier for people to get up to speed in this, in this uh, world. And there are several things that are difficult about it. And I think this quote is one of the best ones to describe this scenario is the great thing about the standards there are so many to choose from. And so I know in our journey in learning this, like I would start reading a standard, and it would be this huge abstract that promised really great things. And then you're reading, you're like pages and pages in, and like, when is this actually going to tell me how to do anything? And then suddenly it stops, and there are three references to other specifications. And you're like, well, this is not complete. So you start reading one of those links, and before you know it, there are three more links to other specifications. You're like, when am I finally going to get to the end of this? And then you're like, maybe this is the one that's going to do it for me. And you click that link, and you realize you're back on the first document that you tried to read. And you know nothing. And the other part that's really difficult is these standards historically rename everything that came before them. Like as if every single thing in the standard is completely brand new and new concepts, and there's nothing you should understand about your previous world. Forget everything you know. This is all completely revolutionary. Nothing is leveraging stuff from the past. So it makes it difficult because everything's been renamed. Uh, and then the, the crazy thing is like there's so many options in the specifications. Like almost everything is optional. And so how do you figure out how something actually works? And when you have a very specific thing you want to do, like secure your REST endpoints, and everything is optional, and the specifications are aiming at so many things other than REST, it's like nearly impossible to figure out how to put this together for one very specific task. Uh, and so you know, as you go through these specifications, you start out with a very thing, specific thing in mind, and they keep introducing new concepts that are maybe related to what you're doing and maybe not related to what you're doing. And you feel like you know less as you read these things sometimes. Uh, and so this is just really difficult. So we're going to give like a kind of a no buzzword perspective on how to do this from an enterprise point of view. If you have an application right now which is taking username and password, logging somebody in, and you want to add REST API calls into that, this is what this talk is about. This talk is not about how to authenticate with Google or Facebook and redirect your people back. This is your traditional enterprise, your users are in your back end, and you just want to secure your REST endpoints. How do I do that and not bother with all the garbage that is not important to me? Okay, so we're going to look at uh, you know, 
kind of JSON web tokens, OAuth 2 uh, without JSON web tokens, and OAuth 2 with JSON web tokens. We're also going to look at what I would call the Amazon style approach. Uh, so one of the things that we were doing in our research was we, we asked the question, well, how does Amazon secure all of their you know, billions of dollars that they do on AWS? What are they using? So they're not using OAuth 2. So we're like, what are they doing instead? So they do this technique called message signing, and it turns out that all the source code for the AWS client, which is, is, is written in Java, is available on GitHub. So we picked through it. We found out what they were doing. We thought it was pretty cool. We contacted Amazon and said, what would you think about us you know, leveraging this in some way? And they pointed us to a specification called HTTP signatures, which is actually written by someone from the Amazon AWS identity team. So it's actually pretty much a simplified version of what Amazon is doing, so we're going to look at that as well. And if we have time, we're going to see how these two things could be used together, OAuth 2 with JSON web tokens and this message signing approach, because um, that has the opportunity to give us kind of a two-factor approach to REST security. All right. So we can't really have a conversation about security unless we're looking at the architecture. Otherwise, everything looks like flat, meaningless HTTP messages. And out of context of an architecture, you can't make good decisions. And so we're going to baseline everything with this. We're going to say, at one point, we had a monolith, but now we have microservices, and we have four hops on the back end. right? So we have one, two, three, four. We're going to say we have 1,000 users that hit us every day, and they do a consistent three TF transactions per second each. Three in Bulgarian. That's one of the few letters and numbers that I know. Because uh, it's cheating. It's like almost the same in English, right? So, OK. So we're going to say that we have 1,000 users doing three transactions per second. That is basically 3,000 transactions per second in total Going to the front end, we're going to say we have some sort of Nginx or an HTTPD or an F5 or something terminating the security and then forwarding it to the back end. So since we have four hops required per user request, that's effectively 12,000 transactions per second we're going to be getting continuously on the back end to match our 3,000 transactions per second in total on the front end. So that's what we're going to measure everything by. OK. so. Since many of you are coming from basic auth, we're going to run quickly through how that works. It's incredibly secure. That's slightly sarcastic. That was also slightly sarcastic. I'm in a recursive loop now. So we basically take the username and password, and we glue them together, and we base64 encode that. And of course, that is just shy of uh, human readable. Some people are very crazy. Uh, I know a guy who can read uh, basic, base64 because he's just crazy. No, he can also read ASCII in binary. Not a skill that I would want. So anyway, there's, there's, there's not much to that. And if you see this on the wire, you can steal it. You can be the person. And you have their username and password. And if they've used that password on other sites and that username on other sites, you can potentially log in as them many, many places. So that's obviously a not a good thing. Uh, so we're going to say we have 3,000 username and passwords being sent on the wire to the front gate. That's a big problem. On the back end, typically, we have no authentication going on. So who is actually securing calls between services in the back end? All right, that was five hands maybe out of, I don't know, 100 and some people in the room. So n not, a, not a good turnout, right? Uh, who here has heard of Equifax? OK. That was a company in the US that they control the social security numbers uh, for, for, the, for your credit reporting. It's, in the US, we have a thing called a social security number. And if it gets stolen, people can open credit cards as you. They can enlist you in the army. They can do all sorts of things for you. So you don't want them to be stolen. They're extremely private. And you can't get a new one if it's stolen. You just have to live your life with somebody else out there knowing your social security number and opening bank loans as you and doing anything as you. They lost 160 million credit card numbers, or social security numbers, because someone used a vulnerability in struts to get in the front door 
So they pierced through that little line there, and once they were in the backside, the backside was wide open, and they could grab 160 million social security numbers and get out. And of course, the impact for Equifax was that their stock went down $4.4 billion in a week. That's not a small amount of money. So we have to secure the back end because if people sneak through the front door and we have a wide open back end, it's a really, really, really big problem. Okay, so if you were to actually send the username and password, then you would have the situation where you have to check them. If you were gonna forward the username and password every hop, you would have to check them. On that bottom, when we're checking username and password, we're gonna have something like an LDAP or an Active Directory or a database. And in this scenario, it's already doing 3,000 transactions per second. It has to match the number of username and passwords we verify in the front. So if we're now checking them in the back, it's 15,000 username and passwords per second that it has to, that it has to check. LDAP is not meant to scale like this. It's not designed to whole host and, and, and withstand that much traffic. So typically what people do is IP whitelisting. They say, this machine can talk to that machine and that's it. And they do a route that's, that's locked to the IP address. The problem with this is it's a natural enemy of elasticity. If you want to be able to launch off a bunch of machines and shut them down, what happens when you launch off a new machine? You get a new IP address. So what are you gonna have? A whole team of network administrators typing in IP addresses as fast as they possibly can? That obviously isn't gonna work. Uh, and so white IP whitelisting is what a lot of people are doing to secure their backends, and basically it's the role of the networking team who's doing this, but it doesn't work in an elastic world, so it fails us. Uh, that also gives us architectures like this, and this, this hints back to the Equifax type of issue, which is if microservice A says to microservice D over there, give me all of Joe's salary information. Microservice D says, sure, here you go. Well, the problem is there's no proof that Joe is actually on the other side asking. And so if, you, if no proof is required, when someone gets through your front door, they do have the ability to basically bulk download lots of data because they don't have to prove that there are so many users on the other side. So this is, a, this is a big problem. We don't want to write systems like this. That microservice should not give Joe's salary information unless there's some proof that Joe is on the other side asking. And we'll see how to do that in this talk. So let's also say that the evil country of Latveria uh, decides to wake up one day and, and hack us. By the way, is there anyone here from Latveria? No? No one from the Marvel Universe? That's where Dr. Doom lives? Yeah. Okay. So, the Latveria wakes up and they're sending 6,000 transactions per second uh, of fake credentials to our front gate, attempting to find a way to hack in, All right? So now what happens is we have 9,000 transactions per second going against our LDAP store, which means that bad users are able to affect the user experience of good users. Right? The people who we want to get through, they're getting slowed down by the bad traffic. So this is also a big flaw of, of OAuth 2, uh, of basic, basic OAuth. So now we're going to look at OAuth 2 and how it solves, of course, all of these problems. First of all, OAuth 2 is based on, on the concept that you don't have a username and password. Each time you log in, you're given a token, and that token is specific to your device. So if you have an iPhone, an iPad, and a desktop, each one of them will have their own token. So you have logged in once on your iPhone, and then you'll have a specific token on your iPhone. You will have logged in on your iPad that will have a token. You'll log in on your desktop. That will have its own token. And the, the advantage of that is, is if you lose your iPad on a plane, which I have done, uh, you can just go to whatever site you're using, and you can find that device in the list and say, revoke access. So if, you're, if, if anybody here uses Twitter, all right, you should use Twitter. It's a great way to like, be globally known and get awesome jobs because people see how awesome you are. It's, it's like self-advertisement. Uh, anyway, if you go in, in Twitter, you can see there's actually a section in the Twitter settings where you can see all the devices you've used to access Twitter, and you can, you can just say, revoke access for that iPad. They're using this to do it. 
And so anytime you may lose a device or whatever, you can just go ahead and poke out the credentials for that. All right? How do you get an access token? Well, here's the process. Basically, you take the username and password, you know, like if you had a form on a page, there's a username box and a password box and a submit button, and it form your own codes, the username and password, and post it to the endpoint, and then you get back an access token and refresh token pair. Now, I know this is super, super, super groundbreaking because you've never used a form on a website to post a username and password to a server and get back a number that you have to track. That is totally not something we haven't been doing for the last 20 years exactly. The funny thing about this is that the OAuth 2 spec group made this decision to basically use the exact same process that we're using now to log in, but they don't call it logging and they call it grant. So they made the decision to not change it technically so that you wouldn't have to rewrite your code and you could use the same login code, but then they went and renamed it so you don't think that you can reuse the same stuff because it's called something else. So it's kind of defeating the point. We outsmart ourselves sometimes. Okay, so we get back an access token and a refresh token. What we do with this is we send the access token with every request and we use now bearer as the authentication scheme and not basic. And we just keep sending this access token every request and everything's fine. And then bam, eventually we get a 401. And what happened is that our access token expired and we have to get a new one. So the, a very core principle behind OAuth 2 is that that access token is on the wire. It's capable of being stolen just like you're using them in password. So as a result, we're going to try and change it frequently. And so uh, Google, by default, will expire these once per hour. Twitter will expire them never. And that matches the level of security that they need. You know, Twitter, it's like if someone tweets as you, they might say something about Kofifi, and then you can just say, my account was hacked. That was a, a fun presidential reference. Maybe not fun. OK. <laughs> So now that our access token is expired, we have to get a new one. So what we do is we take this second credential we had, which is our refresh token, and we post that instead of our username and password, and we get back another access token refresh token pair. And the reason we do that is we don't want to prompt the user for their username and password every hour just to expire the access token. So we basically were given this second little number, the second little string, and says, use that when you want to refresh the access token, when you want to rotate that thing out, or we, when we force you to because we expired on our side of the fence, you have to use this little number. And the great thing about that is we're already into a completely optional specification of part of OAuth 2. Refresh tokens are completely optional in OAuth 2, and how they work is completely unspecified, such that I've seen OAuth 2 implementations that don't support refreshing, so the access token lives forever. Well, it's kind of a bad OAuth 2 implementation. I've seen ones that use the same refresh token all the time, which means that if you're refreshing once an hour every day for a year, there's a pretty high chance that eventually someone may have seen your refresh token, and then they can just go ahead and log in as you anytime they want, anywhere they want, without your username and password. So we don't want that. We actually want these things to be single use, and we want to expire them the second they're used and get a new one, and they should be rotated as, as aggressively as we're rotating the access token. So that's one of those things that if you're using an OAuth implementation now, you might want to go check to see what you're doing for refresh tokens. Okay, so that was our old access token refresh token pair. Here's our new one, and then we just go ahead and post the new one, and now we can continue invoking messages like normal. Okay, so what have we achieved? Well, you have more passwords. At least your devices do. And this is the funny thing is, if you're basically posting something that's about that long, it's same size as your username and password, and if it gets stolen, they can be you, how is it essentially different than a username and password? It's not. You just have a lot more of them. And the, this is the kind of the funny thing that, that we, we achieve when we write these specifications and we give them really fancy names like access token. It sounds really official. 
And it's very, and, and since the specifications are so large, I mean, I basically glossed over like 40 pages of specification. And ultimately, we're seeing that very little is actually new. And this is one of, so if you bring a vendor in and you say, you know what, we're trying to get rid of our password-based system. What's your solution? Go. And the vendor goes, tokens. And then you're like, what is that? And you're, they go, and you immediately, oh, all of our smartest customers are using tokens. You look like a smart customer, don't you? And then you're like Googling under the table. You find the OAuth 2 specification. It's very strange and it's 40 pages long. You know you can't possibly read that in the room. So you're like, yep, I guess we'll look at that and get back to you. And you roll it out and you think everything's fine and you've achieved a lot. But in fact, it's just a lot of syntactic change, word change on top of the systems that we already have. So what would be a more honest way to say grant? Well, it's just logging in. So if the OAuth 2 specification said we're logging in and you post the username and password and you get back an ID and you use that ID every time thereafter, you're like, you would ask the question, how is that not a session ID? And why is this called granting and not logging in? And they would be like, no, no, you don't understand it. Grants have nothing to do with logins because they're more awesome. Okay, why? Well, we can do more with them like uh, access code and log into Facebook and all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah, but if I'm just using username and password, isn't it the same thing? No, no, I don't think you get it. That's typically this, the, the kind of conversation you have. So I like to call, you know, token. What, what is that? That's a very generic name. It sounds super important. What's a better name for token? I like to think of it as a slightly less crappy password or an equally crappy HTTP session ID, you know? And so that's the funny thing is that a lot of times when we're rolling this stuff out, we're hoping to get a stateless architecture. And what we have is basically a lot more passwords in the same stateful architecture we had before. And so if you look at this situation now, what we've achieved, is we're going to say for the sake of argument that we have all of our users have to log in with their username and password once a day. So we're going to have 1,000 daily hits against LDAP. All right, well, it was 3,000 per second. Now it's 1,000 a day. So that's a major gain. LDAP team is going to be like, Whew, thank you so much, guys. Uh, provided you don't give them the responsibility to maintain that piece of new infrastructure down at the bottom, which is the token server. The token server now replacing LDAP is going to get the 3,000 transactions per second because it's going to have to check these little, to these little access tokens to see if they're valid uh, and get information about you because that access token has no way for you to know who it is. So it is basically, that is now your HTTP session store filled with, H with session IDs, but it's worse. Who has any requirements that you have to be able to say, who was this person who logged in and did this thing last year? And that's pretty much everybody who has a, a, a healthcare-related requirement or a, a financial-related requirement. You need to be able to survive an audit. And when the auditor comes in and says, can you prove to me who this person was who breached your system or accessed this data last year, you're going to have to take that little token and you're going to have to be able to pull the user information out from it, which means you have to keep all those tokens in that token store. Well, what happens if that token store is churning tokens once an hour for 1,000 users every day for several years? It's going to grow huge, right? So what I've noticed a lot is people roll out these systems, and they go, it's performing great. It's fantastic. And it's very fast, and then like, Three years in, they say, it's starting to fail sometimes. We don't quite know why. We haven't changed anything. Nothing's different. And then five years in, it's like, this thing is failing all the time. Because eventually, you're going to have a big data problem, and that is your center point of failure, because it's receiving every single request that comes in has to be validated against it. So not only do you have a center point of failure, but the number of things in the database are going to expand gr dramatically over time, and you will reach the limits of the storage system. And it also doesn't solve this problem. So if microservice A says to microservice D, can you give me all of Joe's salary information? First of all, how do you know that that little token is Joe at all? You don't even know what that means. So that microservice A is going to say, who the heck is, and made up a little string. And microservice D is going to say, I have no idea. 
let's ask the token server, because that's the only thing that knows how to take this string and put it into user information. So of course, now we're getting 12,000 additional transactions per second in the back end against our token server, at which point it is servicing 55% of all of our transactions, and it promptly blows up into a huge flame of fiery death, and now we're getting zero transactions per second. So, do we want a center point of failure that is going to grow exponentially over time and have a big data problem to receiving 55% of our, of our transactions in our back end? No, we do not. But we still want to secure the stuff on the back end. We want to do things right. We don't want the same stateful architecture that we had before. Um, and so, you know, uh, here's another fun one. Instead of access token, maybe we could call this access primary key. That would definitely not sell. Imagine the same scenario. What's your solution for passwords? And you said primary, then we wouldn't get the word out of your mouth. They'd kick you right out the door. Right? My own developers can come up with primary keys. Come on. Uh, access pointer, not very attractive. You know, access string might be a, a simple, another name. What's, let's come up with another name for OAuth 2. I like to call it high frequency password exchange algorithm. That definitely would not sell either. What's your solution for passwords? A lot more passwords. OK, so before we go into this next section, um, let's propose a, a computer science problem. So we're going to say that we have uh, a file on disk, you know, several files in a directory, and when they change, we want to act on it. We don't care, only, we only care if the contents of the file changed. Do we check the date stamp of the files? Who says that one? By the, all right. Yeah, we got one. I like the brave people that actually have raised their hands. So who's here in this session today? <laughs> okay, that was just a calibration just to know how many hands I could possibly get. It's about 80%, so we're gonna count that as 100%. 20% of you, I really apologize. Your arms don't work. It's, it's a, you know, I feel for you. Uh, all right, who says we're going to uh, see the file size? Does the file size change? We're going we're gonna to act on that. OK, we got a couple hands. Uh, who says both? All right, so I'm going to raise my own hand because I've actually written code that did both. Uh, the right answer is you hash the file. And so hashing and signing is effectively at the forefront of everything we're doing today in just in almost everything. Like GitHub, those little IDs you see there, they're hashes. Bitcoin uses hashes. Uh, hashes are how we basically summarize data into one magically, statistically unique number. Uh, and and, and it's, it feels like magic. And I'll try to explain it. And then how you protect the hash is you basically encrypt it. So if you understand these two techniques, Everything that comes after this is all syntactic sugar. You can leave the room with the knowledge that I could probably, and you could probably write all of this stuff yourself. Um, all right, so let's say we have a snow globe and there are 256 snowflakes in it, and each one of them represents a bit, okay? So a hash is a, is a short number. And as the data comes through, we shake the snow globe and we mix up those ones and zeros as much as we possibly can, and when the data stops, Wherever the snowflakes stop, boom, that's it. So we end up with a series of ones and zeros. And of course, I've cracked open the snow globe. You can see the snowman's actually crying. It's a, little, a little tear. He's not melting, it's just tears. I just wanted to draw a snowman crying, just for, for my own entertainment. So that's our hash, OK? That is a statistically unique number that represents the data that it went through. Um, the larger the number, the more snowflakes, the stronger the hash. So uh, if we had, say, one bit, right? Could be true or false. It's a 50 50% chance we're going to shake one bit, the data goes through. I mean, you wouldn't need to do much to change the data that goes through to represent that as either one of the combinations. So the more things you add, the more potential combinations, and the more statistically unique it can possibly become. OK? So, we used to use SHA-128 uh, for our SSL, and it wasn't because we discovered a vulnerability in SHA-128 that we stopped using SHA-128. It was simply that the computing power caught up to it. And so this is a never-ending rat race 
where we're always going to have to increase the number of bits to be just a bit bigger than what modern computing can do. So that's an interesting one is most people go, oh, someone discovered a vulnerability in, in this hash algorithm and therefore we can't use it anymore. It's not there was a vulnerability, it's just that the computing power caught up to it. So now we're using SHA-256 for basically everything and in the future we'll be using SHA-512 and beyond that we'll just keep going. All right, so here's another way to, to, to describe it because what I showed the snow globe doesn't feel deterministic and it's very, very key that you understand that these numbers, if you put the same data through, you will always get the same number. If you change one bit of the data, you will get a different number. And that way you can protect everything in this, right? And so let's say if we have a keyboard, all right, and, it, and each key represents a bit. And they all start out as zero, and when we press the key, it toggles it from zero to one or one to zero. So basically it toggles the bit on and off, true and false, true and false, each time we hit it. What we do then, if you want to imagine a deterministic way that we will always get the same number that's easy to understand, we're going to play the data like sheet music, and that's going to affect what keys we press, and if someone changes one note of the sheet music, will we press different keys? Yes, and therefore we will get a different hash. So that thing at the bottom represents our hash, which is sometimes called a fingerprint. And so if you want to imagine it as the, those are the keys we touched and we left a fingerprint on them, it's a nice way to remember how this works. So basically, by looking at what keys we touched on the keyboard, we have a way to statistically uh, summarize that data. It seems like magic, but it works just fine, um, and, it's, and it's how we, how we survive. So, uh, let's say we have a scenario where we have a file like this. Uh, these are US sports teams. I, I probably should have made them local. But uh, anyway, so we're going to say uh, the first sports team you know nothing and care about is beating the second sports team you know nothing and care about. Uh, 33 to 10, okay? Uh, and the second sports team gets really mad. So first of all, the hashes for this file are going to be exactly this. If you ran that input through, a hash, through any of these hashing algorithms, you would get these hashes as a result. Anybody could do it, and that's why I say this is deterministic. If the competing team decided that they were gonna change the score from 10 to 30, so it wasn't so much of a, of a defeat, and by the way, this is clearly not soccer because that would be one super long game to get 30 as a score. All right, so then, the hashes would actually be different. And so that would be the way that we could look at a hashed number and see that the data has actually been changed on us. So the trick becomes, if one side of the stadium says the hash should be this, and the other side of the stadium says the hash should be that, we need some way to tell who's telling the truth. Now Bitcoin solved this by popularity. So if more than 50% of people say the hashes are this one, and less than then say the hashes are this one, the, the majority wins. So who wants a security system where if the majority of hackers agree they should enter, they can come in? <laughs> yeah, nobody. So what we have to do is we have to protect these hashes. And so what we need to do is we need to encrypt that hash using symmetric or asymmetric keys. And the symmetric basically means both sides can read and write. And we don't want that. We want one person to be able to, to encrypt that hash, and we want everybody to be able to decrypt the hash, but we don't want them to be able to encrypt the hash, so we use asymmetric keys instead. And effectively, in this scenario, we would say the referee holds a private key, calls the score, it says it's you know 30 to 10, and hashes that. The referee then encrypts that hash with the referee's private key, puts it back in his or her pocket, distributes the public key to the stadium. Everybody in the stadium can have the public key, and then they can all check the score at any time, uh, the, the truth of the score, by rehashing what someone is telling them the score was, checking it against the, trying to decrypt that with the public key and see if it matches the one that was floating out there in the world. And if it does not match, then it's not true. So effectively what we're able to do is solve effectively read-only distributed data. 
The, the score is publicly readable. It's not encrypted. It's not hidden. It's viewable by everybody. And if we know the hashing algorithm, say SHA-256 or SHA-512, we can come up with the same hash number. And if we know what the name of the key was that encrypted the hash, we can use the public key to decrypt it and then find the raw hash and compare the two of them together. So it's a basically a two-step process where you have to know what hashing algorithm did, let's well, so gonna say that that's Susan down there, she's the referee, what hashing algorithm did Susan use and what key did Susan use to encrypt that ha the resulting hash? And on what data, all right? So that is effectively how we can determine uh, and, and that the data has not been tampered with and that Susan is the one who made it because it was made by Susan's primary key or, or pub, private key. So here's a question. How many RSA key pairs do you need to sign one million documents? Excellent, exactly. Only one. You only need one SSL certificate to basically encrypt all and uh, do, S, uh, do SSL for all of your consumers because the, the private key represents the person who has authority over the data, right? You don't need, it doesn't represent the data itself. The hash represents the data. And so the key is fine just to say who is the one who made it. So now this brings us to OAuth 2 with JSON Web Tokens. So we're going to see how this concept applied to OAuth 2 changes it dramatically. So first of all, JSON Web Tokens are pronounced JOT. You all knew that, right? Of course. Everyone knows that that's how you pronounce W is an O. I guess maybe in Latveria that's how they pronounce it. That's probably where it came from. Like in Germany, it's V or whatever. If it's W, JSON Ved Tokens. Uh, and it's basically a fancy JSON map. Okay, and we base 64 encode it, and then we hash that number, and then we sign, and then we encrypt that hash, and we put the encrypt, we put the signature, which is basically an encrypted hash, we put it together with the JSON data, and we send it out to the world. And then everybody who sees this token can read the data. So let's say that the data looks like this. Uh, we're going to say we have a JSON Web token for Snoopy, which is a cartoon character in the U.S. I don't know if, he, if he's over here. It's a rascally little dog with a fun Woodstock pet who's a bird. Uh, anyway, and we're going to say that he has the, the scopes, which of course, term alert, what are scopes? They're roles? No, man, scopes are not roles. Scopes are totally different. They, they say what you can and can't do and they're simple strings? Yes, then they're roles. No, no, you're not getting it. Okay, so we have to rename everything, of course. So scopes are roles, and we can say that Snoopy has the role Twitter, and man's best friend, and we have the expiration of this access token there in the bottom. We have IAT, which means issued at. That's what time the token was created. Uh, and then JTI, which is a token ID. And we basically, we can put any information we want in this token. We base64 encode it. We encrypt it. We, we, we RS-256, which means shorthand for HMAC so, excuse me, shorthand for SHA-256, and RS means that we used RSA. So we, we basically signed the data with SHA-256 with SHA uh, and an RSA key, uh, and then the type is, is JSON Web Token. So the thing in the bottom is the actual resulting digital signature, which as I mentioned, digital signature is shorthand for hash that's encrypted, and then that's base64 encoded, and it's sent on the wire, and so our old access token looked like this, and our new access token looks like that. Amazing. Microphone drop. Or I guess I gotta ring this thing off and chuck it on the ground. So at this moment, most of you are thinking, oh, I want the shorter one. And that's why we have to show the architecture. Because, of course, I would think the same thing, I want the shorter one. But it has a very subtle but high impact, okay? So what we had before was when someone logged in, we scooped information out about them from LDAP, we made a little pointer, we put all the information about them in a session store, and we sent the pointer back to the client. And every time that we made a re had a request come in, we had to check the session store. So the client holds a pointer, and the server side holds state. Now what we can do is when someone logs in, 
We pulled our information out from LDAP. We put it in a JSON map. We signed the JSON map with the private key of the authorization server, the thing that checks the username and password. And then we put a pointer to this in a database, and we send the JSON web token back. And now what we have is the reverse. The client side holds the state, and the server side holds a pointer. So effectively, JSON web tokens change OAuth2 dramatically. OAuth2, with the simple access, access keys, is HTTP sessions. And OAuth2, with JSON web tokens, is basically HTTP cookies. And the unfortunate thing is they're both called OAuth2. So you have to know which style you're using, or you could have a stateful architecture or a stateless architecture. So how you get the, the access token that is a JSON web token is exactly the same as before. We, use, we post the username and password using the same techniques. No changes need to be made in the client. We get back a much larger access token that is the signed JSON map, basically our, our signed cookie, if you will. And we send that instead of the short access token. We send this big access token, and then everything keeps going. So what we have achieved is effectively, we're going to say we still have everyone logging in once a day. So we have 1,000 users logging in. And now they're sending 3,000 transactions per second with the access token that is the JSON web token. And what we're able to do is we're able to check that token using just the public key. We, we check the signature of the token. And if the signature check matches, we know we made it with the private key that is not distributed. We have to keep that private key by name private. So we can check it with the public key corresponding to the private key. And if the signature check matches and is good, we know two things. One, this token is a token we made, so it's valid. And two, the data inside the token has not been tampered with. So at this moment, we do not need to check any database stores to see if this token is a good one that we want to honor. We simply check for the signature. And if the expiration date in there is still valid and it hasn't expired, we let it through. If the expiration date is bad or expired, we don't let it through, and we make them do a refresh. OK? So the, the amazing thing about this is that we're able to tell good tokens from bad tokens with just a little bit of memory and CPU. A public key is less than 1K in size. And a check on a public key, uh, a digital signature, is very fast. So using the private key to sign the data is about this much computing power. It's on purpose. Using a public key to verify the data is about that much computing power in, 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 in reference. OK. so. Now we're going to say that we're, for the purposes of forcibly logging people out, we're going to keep a pointer in a database. But we're only going to check that pointer when they go to do the refresh. So that would be every hour if, they wanted to if you wanted people to refresh the access token every hour, or every half an hour if you wanted to check them every half an hour. You could, you could make the access token live for as long as you want. It could be short, five minutes. And that would mean that every time the access token is refreshed, you would check the database to see, do I want to refresh? All right? So that would be the only time that you would actually need to check a center store. And so instead of having 55% of our traffic going against the center store, we now have 0.55% of our traffic going against, the set, going against that store. That's an exponentially large improvement. This is a truly stateless architecture. We're able to check the good traffic with just memory and CPU, no network calls. And of course, now we're going to say that we're going to pass. Uh, we're going we're to skip this, because we don't have a lot of time. So we're going to pass that, that token from microservice A to D. And so if microservice A calls microservice D and does not pass the JSON web token with the call, microservice D should say no. The right way to do it is to pass the JSON web token from hop to hop. So that way, Joe's identity keeps going with every hop. And each microservice can check Joe's identity to be true or false by simply having the public key. 
which means that that microservice does not need to make any network calls passing the public key to a center or saying, is this valid? Uh, and so now we have this, this situation where microservice A says, give me Joe's salary information, and if microservice A passes Joe's JSON web token to microservice D, microservice D should say, sure. So if you had an Equifax-style security breach and your hackers got into their front door and they were sitting in microservice A and they asked microservice D for Joe's seller information plus 159 million other or 100,000 other social security numbers, microservice D would say no to all 160,000 requests because there is no proof that any of those people are on the other side. And that's how you can protect yourself from a very severe security breach in the back end by simply requiring proof that there's the right user on the other side. So JSON Web Tokens actually not only provide us with a stateless security architecture, but they provide us with a very huge benefit of protecting ourselves from having bulk amounts of data leave our enterprise because we've been hacked via security vulnerability or any other reason. So let's also say that bad traffic comes back again and they're trying to gain entry to our front door. So we have 6,000 transactions per second going against uh, the front gate. And now we're able to basically say, all right, I'm gonna check these bad tokens with the public key and if they don't work, I drop them on the ground. I don't have to check a database to see if they're valid. Little bit of CPU check and a little bit of memory and I can reject all bad traffic. If you can find a way to reject all the bad traffic and not use any CPU power, then I say you probably did a trick question and you, and you shut your computer off. This is like a riddle, but we actually want to request through. So with just a little bit of CPU overhead on those 6,000 transactions per second, no additional stress on our token store, we can let the 3,000 transactions per second through and they don't affect the good traffic. Okay, so we're gonna quickly go through this. Here's the Amazon style approach to this. Uh, they do an alternate approach, which is basically signing the HTTP messages, okay? So uh, there's the specification reference, and by the way, at the bottom of there, you can get uh, all of the references from this talk, the slides for this talk, and a video from a previous recording of this talk. So if you take a picture of any of these slides at the bottom, you can get all this information. Okay, so signing an HTTP message is again using the hashing and encrypting the hash technique with a key to prove something, all right? Here we're going to say, uh, to set the scenario up, this is Amazon. You have an API key and an API secret that is associated with your code. You download it once, you bake it into your code in some clean, secure way, and you use it every time you make a call, all right? So if you have a 1,000 users, you'll have given them, a th and they wouldn't be users, they'd be a 1,000 pieces of software. On the other side, you've given each one an API key. So this is identical to AWS, all right? So you are now the caller. You have your API key, you have your API secret, and you want to prove that you should be able to call the AWS services. So first of all, they're going to say, you must sign your message. So you, you select the headers that you want to sign. You make a signing string out of them, which is basically saying, we need a data, piece of data to hash, right? And then we're going to, then we're going to encrypt that hash. So here's how we make the data to hash. We pick the headers we want. We concatenate them together with a new line. We lowercase the headers, and we leave the values unchanged. Now, there is a pseudo request target header that allows us to protect the post part, which is the HTTP method and the path. We hash that signing string. We, we encrypt it with our key. And then we put all the thing back in the message. There's our base64 encoded signature. We tell the server on the other side, we use the request target to host the date and the content length headers in that order, because of course, what happens if I change the order of the headers. Will I get a different hash? Of course, and it won't work. So we need to tell the receiving server what order we've made these, uh, concatenated these headers together, and then what key, right? So we say orange one, two, three, four. 
And then we pass that to the server, and the server retraces our steps. It sees the message that it got. It goes, OK, I should take the request target, the host, the date, and content length together, make a signing string, a document. Then I'm going to hash it with HMAC and SHA-256. I'm going to digitally sign it with HMAC, SHA-256, using the key orange1234. So Amazon has your API keys and your API secrets in the back end, and they retrace your steps when they receive a message. And if once they retrace your steps, they get the same signature that you sent them, then they know that you should be able to come in. If they don't get the same signature, they know that one of two things happened. Either one, you don't have the key you're supposed to have, in which case you're not the user that should be talking to them, or two, your message was tampered with after you sent it. Either way, that's enough for Amazon to say, you can't come in. Okay, so this is an awesome system, but it doesn't solve the back-end security. You can't pass that signature from hop to hop, all right? And so there's a new concept they're coming out, and it's called basically uh, combining OAuth2 JSON Web Tokens with this signing approach. And this is a bonus. If you understand up to OAuth2, you're fine. And I'm out of time, but I'll go through this pretty quickly. Uh, if you understand any of this stuff, consider it a bonus, all right? There aren't a lot of systems that do this, uh, but it's, it's emerging. So a JSON Web Token is a passport without a picture. If someone has the ability to steal your username and password, they have the ability to steal your JSON Web Token. The difference is a JSON Web Token has a lot of information about you, but no way to tell that the person who presents it should be the one that should hold it. So someone picks it up off the ground, they can get through the door as you, and that's it. And they have all sorts of permissions in there. So if you're a hacker, and you have the ability to steal username and passwords, you also have the ability to, store, to steal JSON Web Tokens, and they have permissions like admin and so on and so forth in there. So if you're smart, you would just wait until you get a really good-looking JSON Web Token that had a very nice permission in there, and you would walk quietly through the front door, get what you want, and leave. Okay, so what we do instead is we modify the access token, we put a key name in there, and we give the user, when we give them the access token, we give them a symmetric key to use. And so what they do is they combine Amazon style, signing the message with these identity tokens, and now we're gonna say, here's our, our, our JSON example of the key, we're gonna say that when they send the request, they have to sign the request with the key referenced by the access token. We're gonna check both the signature of the access token and the signature of the message, and if both factors are true, we let them get in. One of the factors is not on the wire, and that's the actual symmetric key, your API key, your Amazon key. And one of the hard things about signatures and, and, and symmetric keys is rotating them. Well, the natural thing is that we are actually able to rotate out the symmetric key with the access token. And so when we called OAuth2 high-frequency password exchange algorithm, it can also be high-frequency symmetric key exchange algorithm. And as I had actually read the OAuth2 or the HTTP signature spec first, when I read OAuth2, I was like, why are you exchanging secrets so much on the wire and not just signing data with them. Why are you just passing the, the, the key every time? So in this scenario, we actually have changed the, 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 the setup quite a bit. The OAuth2 JSON Web Token cannot get you entry alone. If someone presents the JSON Web Token and they have not signed the request that was holding the, the JSON Web Token, you don't let them in. Uh, and so that's how we effectively have the picture on the token. Okay, uh, so we're gonna skip to, to the end here because we have a run out of time. But the, the key things for you to take away of this are that OAuth2 with JSON Web Tokens and without JSON Web Tokens are two completely different technologies. 
A lot of times we roll out, our, you know, we get together as teams and we go, we just wrote a stateless, you know, microservices architecture and you're, you're patting yourself on the back and you go have beers and then your security team, boom, slaps OAuth 2 with, with old access tokens on there and they've given you a big stateful architecture right on top of your stateless architecture and it ruins it. Uh, and then, you know, we don't even know and we're saying, oh, well, it's using OAuth 2 so it must be good. Now, OAuth 2 is not identical. So you have to figure out if you're using JSON tokens or not. Uh, the message signing approach is a very, very uh, gaining popularity approach. It's the Amazon style. And the proof of possession concept combines both. If you have to do any very secure things, that is your one-stop shop for two-factor authentication. All of this stuff, if you understand the hashing and signing approach, you could write your own secure algorithm. A lot of common questions when people see the talk is, how is this different than SAML? SAML is a JSON web token with pointy brackets. That's it. It's basically using digital signatures to protect data, and inside there, there's a lot of information. Okay, so uh, I don't think I have time for questions because the next speaker is going to come. But if you want any of these slides, uh, go to that URL, and you can also send any questions that you have. Um, of course, after having gone through all of this learning, we did write a security gateway that's in beta format right now. So if you want to check it out, you would go to that link. Um, if you don't, if you hate small startups, don't go to that link. Right? If you don't want, if you if you think startups should be unsupported and, and crushed, do not go to that link. Okay, and then so thank you very much, everybody, and I hope you enjoy this session. <laughs>